Hello and welcome to episode 90 of Just Keep Writing. A podcast for writers. By writers. To keep you writing. I'm Marshall. I'm Nick. I'm Brent. I'm Nia. And I'm Will. And we're back, people. And with us this week again is the awesome Nia Davenport. Welcome back to the show. And thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for having me. So this is really (laughs) exciting. Uh, You're back. You were on an episode of Just Keep Writing While Black a while back. And we loved it was me, you and Brent then. And I can't wait to um, to see what we got this week because we're going to talk about your awesome book, The Blood Trials. So I'm going to pass it over to Will to get us started. What you got, buddy? So I know um, if everyone hasn't listened to episode 56, that was Nia's first episode on the podcast. I would go back to it and listen because it's almost uh, a year and two months to today that we actually recorded that. And um, it's been a full month since Blood Trials has been out. So my question, Nia, for you is I want you to describe in three words what it was like writing this book and they can be completely unrelated oh okay that's hard okay so during let me think back it's been so long ago um so during the process of writing um brutal would definitely be one um cathartic would be two um and joyful would be the third and those are completely kind of you're right unrelated I like it. So I want to unpack those three words so we can talk about them. So the first word was brutal. So talk to me about why that word came up. So it was brutal just tackling this story that seemed so big in, I guess, scope and ensemble cast and world building um, and plot from that aspect. It was also brutal from the aspect of coming off of, you know, putting my first book on submission and it not selling and me being like, you know, is this next project going to sell? Am I going to get the same, you know, bump up against the same walls that, that I got with with the former one is it even worth writing it. You know, will anybody ever see value or connect with my story? Um, So brutal in those aspects of just like all the, like the questioning and the self doubt and just, you know, the gate, Keep keeping and really trying, needing to work past it and find, I guess, the inner joy to tell the story, regardless of what might have happened or not happened with it, and learning to write for, I guess, the fun and thrill of writing instead of constantly second guessing is this going to sell? Is this, you know, aspect marketable? Is this choice I'm making with the story come? compelling i don't think i've ever second guessed my like instincts and like my and like myself as much as i did while writing the blood trial okay just those those answers have spun me off with more questions but we're gonna wait for that because i don't want (laughs) to get crazy um cathartic talk to me about that word Okay, so the very first draft came right after the 2016 election. And, like, obviously we knew things were, like, shit before the 2016 election. There was no surprise there. (laughs) But (laughs) but the 2016, so I think election for me, I think it might have been, like, maybe one of the first times in my adult life where, like, you know, you know, knowing it's things were shit like was just kind of like blown you know up to this like enormous proportion um to where I was just like like okay I knew it was shit but like it's really 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 shitty like you know um so and you know just as a black woman we always hear like you can't be too angry and you know you know you have to dial down the rage and you know you hear words like bully or like I don't know abrasive um and so you know, writing the blood child, the main character, uh, Kenna, she is like a black woman. She's angry. She's justified and she's righteous in all of her rage, you know, from all the wrongs that this highly racist and this highly misogynistic society has thrown at her. So it was cathartic in the sense that it was me allowing myself to really like sit in that rage and like embody that rage and be like, you know what, F it like we as a community, like we're allowed to feel this and we're allowed to like hurt and we're allowed to like express it. 
um, just like, you know, the current pain as well as the generational trauma without being told that like we can't or that we need to dial it down because I'm in some situations you don't nor should you have to dial it back. Okay. Again, that answer just spewed more questions that I want to hold off for. <laughs> um, because it really relates back to, um, I think, Akena as a character. A lot of things mm-hmm. that you're saying, there's certain lines um, throughout the podcast I want to kind of read out and, you know, talk about. But um, the next one is joyful. Talk to me about joyful. Joyful. So I know we always, I always talk a lot about like the heavier issues that the story deals with, but Britt can tell you, when I started out to write this book, it was like, listen, I just want to write a badass black woman who wields this incredibly cool, like stabby blood magic that's just like, you know, she's like, she's Arya Stark. And just about that life. And she's like, okay, I've been wronged and I'm about to literally come in here and like wreck house. So it was at its heart, me really wanting to take all the tropes from the urban fantasy um, and the epic fantasies that I love. And just, I literally just, without any thought to like, if this is right or or can I do this? Or am I like, you know, mixing too many, you know, sub genres. I just threw everything like Brent was saying earlier everything I love about the things I read and watch and consume I threw it in um and just I think that might have been the most fun I have ever had writing a character and like writing a story because I got to a point where I was like it might not sell anyway so why not (laughs) so I want to just go back um for a minute when you were talking about working through gatekeeping Um, I feel like it's kind of, um, it is something we hear from a lot of artists. It's especially what we hear from a lot of marginalized artists and marginalized women who are artists about they need to let go of their own gatekeeping. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? Like describe it. Do you feel like you were gatekeeping yourself? I feel like I do sometimes. Um, and like, I feel like it's something that I've internalized. Like I know when I wrote the blood trials and before we put it on sub, there was a moment where I called my agent and I was like, is this the wrong project to put on sub? Cause I feel like I've done three things like triply wrong. I was like, one, I wrote a black woman protagonist in a science fiction fantasy setting. And you know, it quote unquote, it is not marketable. So, you know, publishing, you know, like to say, I was like, two, I wrote a sci-fi story to begin with, which publishing at that time was telling, you know, authors that, you know, trying to debut that sci-fi is such an incredibly hard sell. And I'm like, and then on top of that, on top of doing that, I wrote an adult fantasy too. And I'm like that in itself, um, you always hear that it's such an incredibly hard space to debut in and to break out in and it's you know doubly hard as a woman and as a writer of color um so I yeah so just from all of the external gatekeeping there was a moment where I was like I had internalized that and I was like oh oh shoot I I think I I think I messed up with this story um I think I wrote the wrong story and I don't know that it's you know going to sell or that you know it's you know, an editor or an imprint is going to like see value in it and like, like it and want to put it out there because I kind of like ignored all of the, you should do this and you shouldn't do that. Not even thinking about it. Like I said, it was just this incredibly joyful, cathartic experience. I wasn't thinking about, you know, like the business yeses and the business, like maybe don't do that behind it. I was just writing at the time um and so but my agent she's incredible and she was like no this story is solid like it like it's going to sell and it will find its audience and i think me and brent maybe even had a variation of that conversation <laughs> as as like well like i don't know if this story is ever going to you know be published or like find its readership and brent was like no you know like it's a dope story that needs to be heard um and just you know having so many incredible supportive people in like my corner is really what helped me like push past the gatekeeping um, and like just put it out there and hopefully let us see what happens. So I want to talk about 
uh, with Kenna for a minute because, you know, early on in the book, you're setting the tone that she can't be too good at what she does. She has to kind of fall back a little bit more. And we instantly see the racism and sexism that is in this world. So was that something that was uh, unconsciously done about her not having to be too good? Like, or did that come through like later when you're actually like going through like say the second draft? No, it was actually something that was done very intentionally um, and very consciously from like the first draft, just just black individuals in general. Um, and I know just speaking from my like per perspective of, of like a black woman, it definitely Akina may be, may have more threads of me than like any other character I've ever written um, in some form or like fashion. And it was just, you know, I, I, I grew up in like a predominantly white middle school and high school. And then college, I went to USC right there in Southern California. Um, and so I have always had to like, feel like, you know, walk this like line of like being a part of, but not necessarily being enough or being wholly accepted. Um, and then also feeling like, you know, you know, what, whatever the goals are or whatever the ambition or the dreams are, you know, having to work twice or three times or like quadruple as like hard. And this is even true for publishing and like writing too, you know, just to like carve out a space and get sometimes not even as far, but like half as far as <laughs> it just happened for as your counterpart so it was definitely intentional for that to be part of Akina's journey and that to be part of her story for her to be strong and confident in like her abilities and her competencies and who she was but also having to you know walk a tight line between I can't be too good um because I'm going to get shit for it or like I can't be like I can't perform at this level or like I'm going to come under a microscope um and I think we even saw that um back with the Obamas how the entire Obamas while he was president like they were under this microscope to where like every little positive or negative move that they made was dissected hey, can I can I can I throw something out there real quick and I don't know if Brent's role in this like and we've talked about this a little bit, I think, in the last episode. But I think what you're alluding to is the support that you need, the encouragement that you need to fight through some of that stuff. So, Brent, can you talk to some of this process just because you're here and and she mentioned <laughs> you? And 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 I just would like to see because it is a residual from the Just Keep Riding Well Black where we talked about. Go back to that episode because it was amazing. But. I think it's I think it's uh important that you're here and that you talk to that a little bit. Yeah, uh sure. So um so first throw this little factoid out there. Nia's book is the first traditionally published book where I got mentioned in the acknowledgement. So that was really cool. <laughs> I was like, ah, I didn't even know that was happening until I opened the back of the book. I was like, oh shit, that's really awesome. But um yeah, I, I guess in terms of like encouragement, I mean so I was kind of walking through the same thing with Nia with her first book that should have sold, but you know, I'm not going to be bitter, but, um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, we walked through that process and I, and you know, the whole step, the whole process through that I was like, this book is dope. This book is dope. I love these characters. And, you know, it wasn't even for me, of course, you know, you want to support your fellow black creators, but for me, it was just like, I just love this writing. I'm just a fan. Like I'm a fan first, you know, above all else. And um, so when Blood Trials came along, I think uh, me and Nia had um, been gushing together over Never Night. And uh, I think oh, that, yeah. Did, yeah, we just were like in love with that that world <laughs> and that book. And then uh, Blood Trials came along and I was like, hell yes, I, I, I support this. And, you know, this story needs to be out there. And I mean, you know, every time, because um, of course, you know, doubts come along in the writing process or whatever. And I just felt like it was my role as like, not just like as a um not just as a black person, but you know, just as a friend too, to be like, no, I'm going like, I see the value in this story and I, I see the love that's being put into this story and just, you know, making sure that um uh, speaking life into it and it's it's into Nia too, because I think uh it writing can be such a solitary thing sometimes and it can be such a lonely process that 
you have to have that uh, person you can fall back on. And and also, too, you know, to tell you, like, like because Andy was talking about gatekeeping yourself, you got to have that person to tell you, like, it, it, this is black, but somebody's going to like it. And you, you push through and keep right anyway. Don't, you know, don't doubt yourself. And I think that that can be really hard to navigate on your own. If you're if you're a black writer on an island and you're trying to navigate that, it's really hard to because... Because the thing that most people I don't think understand about black people is before we assume something's racism, we done ran that sh- stuff through our head 20 different <laughs> ways to try to be like, nah, maybe it's not that. Like, nah, maybe I'm overthinking it. Nah. And and so it's the same with, you know, being a black writer. You're running it through your head like, is this too black? I don't know. Should I pull back? Like, uh, it, and you got to have I think you got to have that black black writer or black reader or friend or whatever that's going to tell you not. Nah, do it for the culture, push through, like push to write that story. <laughs> and what I love about blood trials is there's so many things that are subtly done that are very much black issues. And that I'm pretty sure I'm not going to, well, yes, I am pretty sure that a lot of non-black readers probably didn't catch on to. Mm-hmm. All right. And maybe if they did, they had to do the, they had to have some knowledge of like black culture beforehand to even catch it. So I think that's, I, I think you brilliantly snuck in some um, black commentary there, Nia. And uh, just um, just overall, I guess, speaking back to encouragement, I want to get too off track, is that um, you got to find your tribe, but like you got to make sure that, um, you know, that it's a genuine connection and uh, it's uh, one of friendship and one that, you know, it's not going to be like with, in the case of Nia, I'm not just going to be here for one project. Like as long as Nia wants to write, I want to read, you know? <laughs> so, and I think you got to build those kind of bonds. And, um, and as much as, I mean, Nia says, I encourage her, she is her success and her path and the journey that she's on has encouraged me to keep going and to not give up on, you know, the things I want to do. And I think that's, it's a, um, it's a positive feedback, you know, like, I'm sure there's plenty of writers who see what Nia's done and the success that she's had. And it's made them say, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to try like this, this, this is worthy. And if one of us can do it, then more of us can do it. So I think it's, it's definitely a a symbiotic relationship. For sure. So can you, um, Nia, can you tell everyone, can you give them the pitch again? Cause I know you did it in episode 56, but give us the (laughs) pitch of blood trials. For sure. I'm like, I am well versed in this pitch now. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so it's basically like a science fantasy where magic and tech clash. Um, the protagonist is a young black woman who grows up in this world that's incredibly racist and that's incredibly misogynistic when she finds out that her grandfather, who is like the commander in chief, has um has um been murdered by his own military council. She throws her lot into these deadly trials to um, become an elite soldier and gain the rank and power. I always say that's necessary to like pull up Arya Stark and basically slaughter all of the men that killed her grandfather. Brent, do you want to start questions first? Because I have some, but I want you to ask. Sure. So uh, one thing I want to talk about when we talk about subtly black things being snuck in there. That um, relationship between the grandfather and the granddaughter feels very Southern and very Black in the way that it is um, portrayed because, uh, you know, the grandbaby, uh, the grandfather with the granddaughter, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a very special relationship in, in Black culture, I think. And the way you write it is um, it, it's so familiar to me. And so um, I guess what I... Did you ever at any point not want it to be a grandfather or thought differently uh, or a different kind of family relationship? Or was it always like grandfather in your head? No, you know, it was always grandfather in uh, my head. And so I didn't start off make, like with the intention of making it very Southern and very Black, but I am very Southern and I am very Black. Like I am from Houston, Texas, and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia when I was like 12 and graduated high school in Georgia and moved back to Texas. So I'm like, I've never been out of the South um, to actually live except a brief stint I did four years out in um, LA for college. Um, but really when I, and it's, so that L- element, just those subtle elements kind of just naturally and organically ended up 
in the story, just me writing from, you know, my own identity and experiences. I, but it was always supposed to be a grandfather and his granddaughter because the initial seeds of like the story started off. When I teach, I teach Othello on a yearly basis. Um, it's my favorite Shakespeare play. And I always teach it. And I know this is, I think it's BS, but I it, it, I, I know it's controversial. It's a controversial take, but I think it's, it's BS that it is a controversial take. But I always teach Othello from the point of view that Othello is a black man. At the very least, he is a dark skinned man. Um, and he has risen to the, you know, the pot, like this, this military power. Um, um, for this society that, you know, is coded majority white and from Iago to other individuals in this society, they hate that they have to hand him power, um, but they need, you know, this warrior prince to like keep them protected um, and to fend off their um, enemies. And of course, like Othello's story is that his fatal flaws that he doesn't see the haters, you know, and he can't, you know, step outside of himself. Um, and see, you know, all of the people that's coming from him from different angles. He like lets Iago feed into his jealousy. Um, so the initial seeds of the blood trial started with what if there was a, a society and a black man like that, but it's but it's not his story. Like he gets he gets murdered at very Julius Caesar style. Um, like Othello got, you know, I mean, Othello didn't get, you know, he was set up and that was his downfall. But I'm like, what if it was taken further than um, that? And the hate that this society harbored for, for like, Othello ended in a Julius Caesar style, just slaughter, right? And then I'm like, so what if he leaves behind this this badass granddaughter who he's been raising from birth in his own image to, you know, you're talking about another like subtly black thing, I feel like we all grapple with this weight pl placed on us by our elders to always need to, you know, surpass and, you know, succeed the next generation. And, you know, if they move, you know, the family and, you know, everybody forward by like five steps, is your job to move forward by 10, right? So what if, you know, this Othello figure, he gets murdered and leaves behind a grandfather, literally raised to kick down doors and snatch the seat at the table that he started fighting for. Um, and if you drop her in this like military world, um, you, 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 you basically get this surviving granddaughter that is fighting fiercely, you know, for vengeance for, you know, the grandfather that was taken away from her. And there, and she doesn't have, this isn't a spoiler, um, because you, you, you get it in chapter one, but it kind of doesn't have, parents who raise her like her grandfather is her parent so their relationship is so close that when he's gone it like destroys her world and, and like gives her this like fundamental shift and like her identity and even just her very foundation um sorry so it destroys her world and gives her this fundamental shift in just her identity and her very foundation um and it's you know, we we see her grieving at the beginning of the story, um, and she goes through this journey trying to figure out how to navigate that grief and like channel the rage that's born of that grief and survive and like live and be an adult without this parental figure that she was super super close with. And so, will you want to jump in there or? Yeah. Do you mind if I just, I want to, I want to oh, yeah. read this section and I have a question because this was the perfect segue. I'm glad that Brent brought up her grandfather because I felt like that was such an important relationship. And there's this one line that will be the last thing I read in this little section. But before this, just so everyone knows, this is a character named Brock who's talking to Kenna. You think you know, but you really don't. The trials are designed to exert every effort to break you, and you are already demonstrating the ease with which you crack under pressure. I flinch at the observation put so badly. The fact that he feels that way means I've been spectacularly fucking up and doing grandfather's memory so much disrespect. We are forged by adversity. We are tempered in perseverance. We are Amaris. I don't know if I said Amaris right, so if I didn't, correct me. But that last line, that quote that she remembers by her grandfather, I felt spoke volumes and says so much in such a 
beautiful line about what he really instilled in in Kenna and and the way that you know um, she was raised. So talk to me about you know that memory of what her grandfather would pass on to her. Uh, Cause I thought, did that just flow out of you? Like, were you just, when you were yeah. writing it, were you like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, this is something my grandfather would say to me or like, how did that come about? Cause I feel like that was just a really powerful line. It, it's something that did just flow out of me. It was, I was writing it and it, I was like, this is something that the elders in my family would say to me. And it's something I would say to my kids as well in times of like, trials or tribulations I was raised very much by a family with a belief that you know yes life is going to be hard let yes things are going to be brutal but at the end of the day like we come from like strong you know tough you know stock and that you know like you keep fighting um or like you you know you you get knocked down and then you get back up and you like keep going and you know the only way to like truly like fail or to truly like you know, like crash and burn is to just never stop fighting. Like I, I grew up in a household where I, I, I can say the word like I failed. <laughs> like that's how like it was like no failure is not a thing. Like you in or like I, I, I like I can say that that I can't do something. It was always like you can do it. You just have to figure out the how. So I very much grew up raised with you know that way and with that mindset that no is not a word I can't do it is not a word um figure it out and so yeah that line came pretty organically and pretty naturally I think just from that um and Akina's grandfather definitely raises her in that same fashion as like far as like there's nothing that you can't conquer and there's like nothing that you're not strong enough to overcome Brent do you want to yeah. So um, to keep that same thread about the grandfather, I also find it interesting how the blood trials critiques respectability politics in some ways, because the grandfather does everything right in this society. He saves this society mm-hmm. and they still hate him for it. And it is yep. a glaring critique of how black people can do everything right they can be the hero they can do whatever they want and i mean the, i mean we have a real world example right now you make one mistake and your whole world gets taken from you and i you know i mean feel how you want to feel about the situation but uh the will smith thing is quite a glaring example of that right now how you you make one mistake and you become the villain and this guy the grandfather didn't even make a mistake and he was still hated for it so I think his only mistake was trying to be a part of this society, honestly. So um, how were you thinking when you dove into that, uh, into the story? Was that like a theme running through the back of your head or did it just kind of emerge out of the writing? That was one of the ones that emerged out of the writing. Um, But as I was writing it and figuring out, you know, how Akina wasn't just, you know, a mimic of her grandfather, um, and like how she really, this was really her story and not his. Um, I very much intentionally made him or molded him to be a man, like you said, who really embodies respectability politics. He, and th- there's a line that comes in the book where a kid is like, he did everything right. Like he, he tried to change this society from like within by playing by their rules. And Akina comes to a point, and I think Akina was always at this point from like the time she could talk, right? Where she's like, fuck that, I'm not playing by your rules because your rules are bullshit and <laughs> they're gonna screw me over anyways. Um, and so she's very much, you know, that, you know, that counter argument to respectability politics as far as like it doesn't matter, like, you know, the way I walk, or it doesn't matter like what I'm clothed in or like how I present myself are you know you know the station that I like rise to like at the end of the day I'm still black and you're they're still going to hate me um and I'm still going to like get this incredibly heavy like prejudice and oppression because of it and Akina is very much from of like the mindset like I'm going to do me and move how I want to move and how I feel is right to move and not necessarily how you know 
society says is the correct way um, to move. Like she is very much the type of character that will take a match and light and blow it up um, versus trying to like subtly and like delicately and nicely fix things from from like within without like I guess toppling the house and Kenna's like yes let's top let's let's topple it right uh, can, I, can, I, can I throw something on the back end of that because I think towards the uh, end of the I don't want to give away stuff towards the end but towards the end of the mountain scene later there's a there's a really interesting moment where people start kind of i don't want to say siding with her but also but at the same time moving in the opposite direction of what you would think because these mm-hmm. people had set out to do x y and z against her and her family and her grandfather and then you start to see char- a couple of characters, one character in pers- in specifically, shift a little bit. And I think that's I think that's really important. So was part of some of the conversation we're having right now about uh, I'm just trying to think of how I want to say it. But when when that shift happens, was that intentional to like this is how it could actually be if you guys fucking get your pull your heads out of your asses and acknowledge the fact that my grandfather did these things and I'm just trying to maintain that. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, that, that shift was also about like the wisdom that in, you know, in real life, too many people don't get and understand when one of us is, are like oppressed, no matter the, you know, the identity we're all in the sunken place and we are yeah. all oppressed and it's like that slippery slope like like you know you 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 know you let you know the powers that be get away with like mistreating this mm-hmm. certain group of people and then it, when this becomes okay then that means then you know this next group be- be- becomes okay and then before you know it we're literally living in 2022 and all of the you know mm-hmm. the things we're seeing um happen in in the news today and around us. Um, but so, yeah, it, it was very much uh, a kind of forcing change around her. I mean, she had to change and grow herself, but also forcing, you know, characters around her to change and grow and to see, like you said, Marshall, um, my, my grandfather was actually trying to make, you know, a better society for all of us, not just, you know, people who look like me and him, but for everybody. And if you, you know, can step away from this indoctrination that, you know, we've all been handed um, from the time we were eight um, in like their world when they go off to these martial academies, um, you would see that it's, 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 it's this corrupt cesspool for everybody. Um, and there's got to be a better way to, to, to like fight to have. Yeah, and and for me, like that was a really powerful thing. I don't know, maybe it was my mindset when I was when I was reading, but I mean, the fact that like I wish people in my life would actually be like, hey, you know what? I actually do see this, you know. Um, I think that I think it's really powerful, and like Britt was saying earlier, subtle if you're not seeing it through the same lens but it was it was it was a lot and and i really appreciated that shift um especially with that particular character towards the end so anyway thank you i have a question so the um what really came about too is the idea of legacy right and about you know handing out this legacy and it's like they constantly want to deny akena her legacy of greatness from her grandfather and try to you know, stop her from achieving. And it reminded me, uh, it reminded me a lot of institutions, right? Where, because I'm first generation and, you know, Akena is second generation. And it just, it kind of reminded me of like, even when a certain generation before you gets to this level, there's still these uh, systematic uh, uh, ways to oppress the next generation from even achieving more than that. When you were building this world, was this something that you uh, automatically knew that you wanted to grapple with in this story? 
kind of the idea of the way that systems work because it just, it was brilliant. So I, not like the very first draft, I think is something that came out as I was world building and figuring out, you know, how Akina and her grandfather and even like the accessory characters, like because Zane and Celine, her two friends who, yes, they're white, coded but they're also you know oppressed in their own way one is a woman who you know she you know goes through her own share of like trials and prejudices and tribulations and the other is like a white male but he's incredibly impoverished so he goes through his own share because of his socioeconomic status um so it was definitely like as i was putting together i guess all of the elements and fleshing out the story that it just started coming together to have this conversation about systems of oppression and legacy and how, like you said, just, I feel like we fight for so much within our finite lifespans, right? Um, and to get so far and it's all to like, you know, improve our quality of, of, of like lives and like leave something better for like, you know, our, our descendants or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's like, we're, fighting but then when the next generation comes if they're bumping up against you know the same or similar hurdles um and having those same setbacks and like challenges is definitely like a commentary on what the hell are we doing and like how do we actually force meaningful significant persistent change and the grandfather this is interesting that legacy gets brought up because in his own way, the grandfather keeps Ikenna from her truth too, because um, and and it's and it's and it's a and it's a commentary too. I think on how um a lot of black parents, especially in like previous generations, would um purposely diminish the certain traits of their children because they didn't want white people to know this, or they would beat their kids before the white person could do so, say something about it. I don't embarrass me in public in front of these white people and, you know, doing these things that um to to basically you you thought you were protecting the kid. That was what you were doing, but you also were diminishing them. And the grandfather does that to Ikenna. He diminishes her from using her gift and being her true self because he's trying to protect her from this this racist society. But in effect, he also puts her in in a bit of danger and he puts her at a disadvantage. So. I, I'm interested, like, because that also gets into some dynamics of like black women and black men and how that how that interacts, too. So, uh, I mean, I, I feel like we talked about this before, but mm -hmm. uh, how was that like how was that like hard to dive into or was that just something that you kind of felt you had to talk about? Uh, I feel like it was something, it wasn't difficult to dive into. I don't normally share away, even when I'm talking about like intra community things, um, because I'm like, it, it dives into colorism too. When you get to a part in the book and you get a revelation um, about a character. Um, but it was definitely something that, while I love the grandfather, he is not a man that is without his faults and like his flaws and it explores it more in book two that yeah, he and I'm like there's this whole thing about a, a, a Kenneth's mom and you get more about her in, in like book two as well. But like because you know he was this man that was so focused on like you said, respectability politics and like raising up the family and the next generation and like achieving this seat at at the table, um, Akina, he suppresses an aspect of her identity and herself um, to protect her, yes, but also because, you know, it would just completely, you know, destroy the space, you know, they have carved out for um, themselves in this society. Um, and like you said, it puts her, it kind of like hobbles her and puts her at a disadvantage because she doesn't really know the entirety of who she is. Um, and so she, we meet her like really an incomplete human being at the beginning of the book. Um, and then when things start to have the conflict start to occur where she needs this aspect um, of herself and her magic that has been so long, just has been like, like, yes, he encouraged her to like explore it in like secret, but she never gets the full like scope of like knowledge um, mm -hmm. and like mastery over it. Um, and so then 
in book one and then in book two when things start to occur that like really make her have to you know step up to the line and like fight for survival not only herself but like a ton of people that's depending on on her um it definitely goes back to the fact that the grandfather in his own way um extremely did her a disservice by not um finding a way for her to you know actually exist with this other half and like be complete with it and like i guess live like live in that truth and like walk in that like reality um and and, and I, I get this question all the time without spoilers is there's this other kingdom right that's basically mm. my version of like something like wakanda if wakanda was without its fault too. <laughs> <laughs> um that's like basically like my like ode to like just this idealized version of like black excellence and like arts and like culture and like flourishing and like um some of my readers are always like why the hell didn't she just say f it and go live there <laughs> like, we're like why, why did she just like pack a bag and be like okay i'm leaving but i also feel like that's definitely a commentary on you know you know the black diaspora is like it's very varied and we we're not a monolith but i feel like this, these are one of those fundamental questions that i grapple with as a black american um like me and my family we we've had several conversations at several points about is this a country when we want to continue to live in do we want to you know raise our children in do we want you know our next generation to grow up here um and if it's not then like where like where do we go and like you know where else would we fit in that you know truly feels like home and that feels like it connects to our roots and to our identity um and i feel like some variation of the conversation always goes back to us staying here because you know just you know the like our family roots as you know far back as we know them are here and like our extended kin are here and like so much of our identity and just um just you know our like just way of life is linked here and i think that answers rereaders questions for why the hell doesn't akenna just leave because this i feel like when you're born and raised in the place that you know you know you you embody in your heart and mind and just everything you are and your identity as as like your home the solution isn't as simple or isn't as you know cut and dry of as, as, as i cut and dry as well why don't you just go so i got a question okay. um, what's the what's the hue of the people asking this question Surprisingly, they're <laughs> our hue. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was checking. They're us. I mean, well, obviously they're us. I'm like, if if they weren't, then they would not get that, you know, the light yeah. of an answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I, I just wanted to check because I'm like, you know, I think I think it's easy sometimes for people that don't understand the roots thing and the uh history thing to say, Oh, why don't you just go and leave someplace else? It's like, well. I can't necessarily leave. And in Akina's case, it's like, if I leave, everything my grandfather fought for meant nothing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I was, I was expecting a different answer on that one. But I can see why we were well, asked that, especially I, now. I, I can see, and, and it's especially in our post-Black Panther age, where, like, yeah. given, you know, us, like, a, a, a picture of what, you know, leaving could look like in the science fiction fantasy space. I'm not too surprised to get that question, like, post Black Panther. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. All right. So I have a question, actually, based on the um, episode 56 that you were on. And it kind of is more about uh, the reception of the launch and, like, how has it been for you since the book has come out? It's been a month that it's out. Um, and tell me, like, what were you delightfully surprised about? And what are some things that you learned, you know, through the launch and just through the reception of the book? I was really thrilled and like, just really like hardened and surprised by all of the, I guess, the reader support and like the support from like the writing community that came in, like leading up to lunch and like at lunch and like post lunch. Um, people have really like, I, I I was very scared. I was like, is everybody going to hate this book? Like, is it not going to connect? Is it not going to find its audience? Um, is it not going to find a readership? But I'm like, I feel like it's 
the people it was written for, they are finding it and they are enjoying it. Um, and they are understanding it and appreciating it. And so, like, one of the things I've, I've that, that's just brought me so much joy is when I get tagged on, like, Instagram or Twitter with, like, pictures of, like, Akena and the book and, like, daggers. I'm like, oh, my God. Just <laughs> tell me yeah. with all of those. They are so incredibly cool. Um, so, yeah, just, like, all of the enthusiasm for Akena as as like a character and just like when I get like messages or DMs just like oh my god like I'm so glad that I found this book and again a story and like I relate to it so much um I've had tons of black women um you know that have reached out and been like you know I I've been looking for this representation um and um and like thank you for adding it like it's not that it's not out there because it is um um, the problem is we shouldn't have to go digging for more of it when we want it. Um, so that's just been super, super cool to just know that she's uh, uh, like Akina is finding her way into like the hearts and like minds and like the love of like her audience. That's amazing. I know. Um, I know. I told you over Instagram the story. I was in line at Barnes and Noble Union Square, and there was this woman who was behind me, and I saw it was blood trials. I was on the <laughs> phone with Nick, and I was like, Nick, I gotta hang up with you. I gotta. Just, <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'm here. And I was like, Oh my gosh! I was like, Mia was on our podcast. Um, her book's amazing, um, and I know because I go in. I go in like mm-hmm. almost every day to Barnes and Noble because it's right near me by Union Square, and. The way New York's uh, stores are set up, each store is allowed to cultivate basically its own type of, um, like an independent bookstore, basically. Mm -hmm. They can cultivate a lot. So their science fiction section is really huge. You know, it's probably bigger than most of them. And um, I asked one of the people that they got uh, 20 copies of Blood Trials in, and they're all gone. Oh, well, that's cool to hear. (laughs) That is cool. Cause that was one right. of my questions. I was like, I don't even know if this is something. I was, like, <laughs> I think I was talking to Brent, and I was like, I don't know if I just have a if my perspective is skewed because I get tagged in you know things where people love it, but I'm like outside of like you know what I'm tagged in. I'm like, does anybody know about my book? <laughs> yeah, and um, I'll send you pictures too if you want. Oh, like yay, you were please. you you were on the so when you go upstairs, they have those tables where they're tailored. Mm-hmm. And so the booksellers are actually the ones building them, um, which I found out. So usually it's like Barnes & Noble, you have to pay for that space. But there's a section upstairs in the science fiction department where the staff just picks whatever they want. And Blood Trials was there. And that's when they were like, "That's it just kept selling out. It was downstairs in the front. So I just thought that just made me think of you. And I thought that was awesome. Yeah, that, that is awesome. Well, it's going to be in my library at my high school soon, too, because I put you on my list of <laughs> recommended books. My librarian's like, I need I need books that the kids will like. I was like, yeah, throw this in there because I, I, it's amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how that's going to affect your sales, but <laughs> appreciate, it. appreciate any and all. Love and support. I want to ask you um, a question. I felt like what you did really good were. Um, I mean, you did so many things good, but what I really loved was your fight scenes and your sex scenes. Mm. So let me just ask, because you did it, you did them both so well. And I, so I trained in martial arts and everything. So when I read a lot of people, when they're fighting, I'm like, that just would never even happen. So I want to ask you, have you taken any type of self-defense class or fighting thing? Because it was, it was on point. I have not, I will say, and you are not the per- first person who, who has said that, that. And I will say all credit is due to my love since I've been about 17 of urban fantasy because urban fantasy has some of the like best choreographed fight scenes that I have ever come across. And I think I've just read so many of them at this point um, that I've kind of like internalized, you know, those specific like, you know, tools and conventions that they use. And I remember, um, when I go to Sirens Con every year, um, it's a science fiction fantasy convention for women and non-binary individuals, and it's absolutely fantastic. And I, right, I think right before I started drafting the blood trials, I sat in on a panel 
um, that was, I think the title was like the science of a fight scene or the anatomy of a fight scene or um, something like that. Um, and not only did I read a lot of urban fantasy, Brent will tell you, I read a ton, ton of paranormal romance too. <laughs> um, so if I can write a sex, I'm like, I learned how to write a sex scene before I figured out how to like really well write a fight scene. But the panel that I sat in on that made, you know, the fight scene click was like, you know, writing a fight scene is a lot like writing a sex scene in a book that you can't just describe like the moving parts. You have to, um, you know, make it specific to the character and have them, you know, you, you know, just not, you know, punch here, hit here, block here or whatever. Because you know, like you said, that gets kind of like just, I guess, sell. Um, but like weaving in, you know, the little like or even the big like thoughts that the characters will have like in the heat of the battle and like the things that specific to their voice and their point of view that they would recognize um while like fighting and like leaving out the things that they wouldn't even like stop to consider um like during the battle um so i i I try to weave that into both my fight scenes and like my sex scenes like yes i'm you know describing the blocking because i'm a theater major too so like my Mm -hmm. mind is always like my mind automatically goes to you know blocking things out probably excuse too much blocking in like some (laughs) things um because like you know my old theater teachers in my head like i always have okay what are you doing now? And then when you deliver this line, like where's your body play placement and what does your face look like and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I just, I always just like combine a lot of like that theater, like blocking that's been drilled into me and try to like combine that with like the characters, like inner thoughts of, and like reactions to what's going on as well as like what they're observing and how they're in like internalizing and processing assessing the things that they're observing during the fight. It's interesting you say that because one, I'm amazed that you just got it through reading because what a lot of people miss about when you're actually sparring with someone is yes, you're looking at the way they're leaning to tell you what they're going to react. But what a lot of people tend to miss is the calculations of the main character and breath flow. And there's been a couple instances where you really mentioned the breath flow of Akina when she was fighting. And I just was like, have you taken martial arts? Cause this is what we're, this is what we're trained to do. Cool. You know? okay. And a lot of, and mm-hmm. a lot of people, when they write it, they don't, they don't get that at all. And I was like, that's, that's really great. So I loved it. So that was like one thank of my, you. your fight scenes were like the best. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. All right, Brent. Okay, so this is a, a question. Since you already wrote book two and stuff, is there a bit of world building that you came up with that didn't get to show up in either one of the books? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so book one, I can say this now because it's not a spoiler because it 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 basically got cut because my editor was like, you know, it leans too much into like the mythology and lore of like the world and kind of like detracts from uh you know you know the tension and the conflict but there was this i loved it you read it brent the cool like that there's a scene that's no longer there where like one of the trials is you know the aspirants going into this pyramid where mm. it is basically it's been cursed by the gods and like they go through hell in this pyramid from like having to survive in like these like icy like lightless waters and a good bit of them drowning to like fighting like this like basilisk and one of them Jesus. getting stabbed with like one of the fangs like it's it is wow but basically each of the pyramids has like a tomb with the old god sarcophagus um and they're sent in they're sent there to get these three relics which all of this is obsolete so they're not spoilers because the the entire plot line got cut from book one um and went in a totally different direction but um that's one of my like oldies but goodie scenes that i'm like i'm gonna have to save and work this back into something (laughs) else at, at some point because it was one of my favorite things to write well, I was just going to ask if it's going to come back at some point, but also was that what the uh, the Ice Peak scene was replaced yes, with? Okay, that is what, yeah, okay. so I, I, I cut that and I was like, shoot, now I need something else. So that's how yeah. we got, yeah, that, 
the mountain of barren ice. Yeah, well, I got to read the first version and it was really cool. And I really want you to rework that into something else. So, <laughs> can, can we get like a deleted scenes release here or something like that for, for the back end? Because I'm all in on this right now. Oh, and wasn't there. Um, wait, no, I can't talk about it. Never mind, because I think it might be in book two. I'm sh- okay, okay. <laughs> Nick, you got anything? You haven't really asked a question yet. Man, y'all are slaying it with the questions. <laughs> like, yeah, I I do. I, I've got a couple questions based on the military aspect of stuff, but that's also another like rabbit hole. So Well, you should probably ask one of them just yeah, so you get a ask question. Them. In. Yeah. Okay, Nia. I, I as a former military person myself, spent five years in the infantry. You nailed something that most people don't know unless they've been in the military, and it is the rank structure that you got. But this, I mean, we see it with Reed, we see it with Chase, like this robota that I am better than you because I outrank you type of thing. Where did you like? How did you learn about this? Where you kind of have these characters, they're all the same rank and they keep each other in check, but they're all still shitting on everyone else who's below them at the same time. Like, like to me, I was like, Oh my gosh, I've been in both these people's shoes. Like I I identify with, with that part of the book a lot. How did you figure that out? How, How did you come up with that? I did. So I did a lot of research as far as like military like rankings and like just like I remember like that that was one of the things I did like actively go and look for like primary source like documents and like, you know, stories and like biographies and like things like that. Um, so it was part legitimate actual like research that I was pulling from. Um like maybe like forty percent. It was like twenty percent. Like I watched like um my mom was like my mom when I grew up, like she was really heavy into like like G.I. Jane and like Murder in Twenty One Hundred, like all the heavy like um military movies. So I'm like, it's part that. Um and then I think again, it's just going back to like Urban Fantasy does a lot of things so freaking well. Um, so, like, when you look at, like, I guess a lot of the urban fantasies that are, like, at their core, like, they're, they, like, have these um, casts that aren't necessarily, like, military, but, like, they're, like, these, like, elite soldiers of, like, this powerful group that, it, they're basically structured, like, you know, that to where, like, they have this camaraderie amongst each other because they're all high ranking. Yeah. Um, but they're basically assholes that shit on everybody below them. A hundred percent. Like you, you nailed that. I was like, oh man, like, wow. Um, and then All I right, think a, a little bit, and then it was also e- equal parts about like getting into like, I don't know, a, a lot of the trials and the structure and the rank just, I, I threw in just, I'm a black Greek. So I'm like that, you know, I'll, all of that was just like a hodgepodge of like many <laughs> different things to get that together. And Marshall over there laughing. I love it. I love no, it. I love it. It was it was so good. Uh, so follow up question. Another one that you kind of nailed. You, you uh, try to keep this brother free. There's a line in there about they're gonna put us through hell to make us bond, and how I kind of doesn't it doesn't resonate with her. She's like that doesn't make any sense. After one of the trials, three or four or five of her peers stand up with her and refuse to listen to support her. And that's another moment where I was like, damn, like, you did it again. You put them through hell to make them bond, even though they didn't want it to. Can you talk about that that type of mentality and digging into that one? And like, why, why did you want them to be closer based on that? So the that mentality 100% came from me being a black Greek, just that idea of like, we're about to go through hell to like, get the sisterhood or get the brotherhood on the other end of hell. Um, <laughs> and then also just, um, 
it, I wanted, like I said, the story is about Akina as a black woman, but I didn't want it to just be about, you know, that and her struggles. I really wanted it to be a story that dove into the struggles of like, I guess, different perspectives and different identities. Um, and to where at the end of the day, even though like everybody except Akina's two core friends starts out against her like the hell they go through like truly does like at some point if we're all facing like certain death right we have to put like the pettiness aside <laughs> um, and get it together and it's just the idea that like literally staring like down hell and like death and like so much like carnage um like you have to be a com- either a complete asshole or or complete sociopath not to bond with your group that you go through that with um, when you come out of the fire on the other side. A hundred percent. Yeah. No, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the military aspect that you have in here. I think it's really well done. It It's world building like to the max, like really appreciate it. It's anyone who's looking to build a military in their books, like read Nia's book. <laughs> first like she nails it she gets a lot of it right brent will back to you guys well i know we're at time so we gotta uh wrap it up here Mm, okay one final question okay um what is your biggest hope for your uh book two Ooh, as far as like what people get out of it or what i can do with it well, what what people get out of it? What what's your biggest hope? Um, my biggest hope is that you read it and you have fun with it, and it takes you on like a ride. But also, there's definitely a question that gets explored about you know that age old adage that like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, book two is for sure a conversation. If we end book one without spoilers, with Akina. And other people poised to do a certain thing. Um, and book two is about Akina grappling with the magic that she has um, that's very lethal and very powerful and very destructive. Um, and Akina and the people that she's with who are poised to maybe do a certain thing. Um, book two is a question of rebellion and war and what this change look like. Do we you know, perpetuate more carnage and more massacres in order to achieve the change. Um, And if we do, does that make us as bad or any better than, you know, you know, the regime we're trying to, to replace or, you know, is there another way? And, you know, I think it's a big question for Akina because Akina comes out in book one, literally swinging, um, like, (laughs) like solving her problems with violence first. um, And, you know, putting the brakes on later and book two makes the kind of have to really question if that's the right way um to solve problems when they involve you know you know when like the weight of and i guess the lives of an entire society you know hinges on how you choose or choose not to react to a situation all right. Ah, uh, that's. I see. I wanted to leave the segue for you to kind of like entice <laughs> readers. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. Ah uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome discussion. Uh, thank you again for coming on as always and for being just this superstar talent that's like out here, really. I I think really pushing the envelope for what um science fiction and fantasy can and should be. So you're definitely adding to an ongoing conversation. So yeah, this has been great. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me. This has been super, super fun. Yeah. We're going to ask the last awesome. question. Yeah, I was going to say, we, we need a version of our last question. Yes. yes. I'm going to do... Phenomenal. I'll let Will <laughs> handle that. All right. So I'm going to change it up because I just listened to episode 56 and Marshall asked kind of this question. So... I'm going to give you a little different one. After, you know, you finished, did you finish? Well, let me ask you this. Or have you completed book two and handed that in yet? Or are you still in like the edit phases? I completed my first draft of book two 
February 1, and I'm waiting for my editor to send me edits back so I can get some of that that phase. Great. So then this is goes well with this question. So, you know, what keeps you writing new stories after you've like really spent time with these first two novels, the first one's out, the second one's written, you're waiting for edits. So what keeps you writing to the next project? I think for me, it's just, it's literally a compulsion and, and they love, I'm like, it's going to sound cheesy, but um, like writing is as much as a hobby as like watching TV or like traveling or like listening to music. Like I can be doing anything and I can like these characters or this world will pop into my head and I'll just get so excited about it and be like, yo, I got to like go grab my laptop and like legit like write this. And it's, um, it's work, but it also just never feels like work because it feels like I am playing in this sandbox. Um, and I, I, I always I always know like the project is working and it's the one when it when I like I don't want to pry myself away from the story and even when I like have to put the computer down I'm still like giddily like thinking about oh this will be cool and I want to go back and put this in and um I want to like get back and dive back in and finish this thing so it's it, as corny as it sounds like like the love and the passion for storytelling. I love that, honestly, because I think a lot of times we tend to focus on like, oh, it's just so hard. It's like, you know, this like writer's strike. And not that that doesn't happen, but I love I love how joyous you always come across when you talk about your mm-hmm. stories and about writing as really joyful and happy. And I think that's such an important part of art because it's really like why we do it because we, yeah. we love it. We love storytelling. So I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. And this has been Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. You can find us at justkeepwriting.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Feel free to reach out to any of us on our social medias, and please jump in our Just Keep Writing Discord channel. Links to all of that is in the show notes. Lastly, please support our show by going to patreon.com slash justkeepwriting. We offer daily writing prompts, early access to podcast episodes, and much more. Thanks for listening, and just keep writing.